Hey, welcome. Uh, we're here. I, I can't believe I'm here, to be honest. I'm I'm at Lee Strobel's house, and I'm, I'm fanboying a little bit right now. Uh, this is Lee, the great Lee Strobel, and uh, you've written uh, The Case For, the series of books, The Case For, and um, it's such an honor to be able to well, thanks. Well, welcome to Colorado, and uh, glad you're here. Glad you can we can spend some time together. Yeah. You know, um, I, ha I have to say, before we get into the interview, I, you know, as a young youth pastor... 1998, I read The Case for Christ, mm. and uh, one, you're an exceptional writer. Mm. Um, a lot of pastors write books, and they, they're really just their sermons, um, mm. but you're a, you were a writer. That's what I did. And yeah. that, that was yeah. one of the things that gripped me mm. reading it, and then you had a couple of my professors read your book, yeah. and I just like, it was uh, doing you and uh, that, that whole Willow Creek gang, Mark, and all those guys, um, really formative in my life That's as a awesome. young pastor. That's awesome. So this is really exciting to be able to interview you. Well, thanks. Uh, that's that's great to hear. It makes my day. Yeah. So I'm going to um, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions on your book Miracles. So yeah. We're, yeah. Um, I'm going to plug this right now. You should get this book. Okay. Um, I read it and then I listened to it on Audible. It's excellent. You you read it as a matter of yeah, fact. Yeah, you know, we got complaints because I, I read all my books on Audible, but uh, I didn't do Case for Christ originally. And we had a lot of complaints that said people want to hear the voice of the author. So I went back and I redid it when we did a, a, a new and updated uh -huh. edition. And uh, I kind of like doing it. It's, it's fun. You get in the studio for three days in a little booth and you're reading the whole book. Yeah, because it's like seven and a half hours. Oh, it takes forever. It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, and how many takes do you, do you A you million, because I'm not good at it. <laughs> some, some of the guys who are really good at it will go five, you know, five or six pages without an error. I make about three mistakes a page. <laughs> And so they have to stop and they have to back up and yeah. 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 That's, that's funny. So yeah. what prompted you to investigate miracles? Because you know, you kind of write from an investigative yeah. evidence-based kind of thing. So what prompted you to investigate miracles? Well, as you know, I was an atheist for much of my life and it was really a miracle, which is the resurrection of Jesus historically that convinced me that Jesus not only claimed to be the son of God, but he backed that up by returning from the dead. Um, so I, I believe that miracle and consequently came to faith in Christ. I believe the miracles in the Gospels because, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, um, they're, they're soberly presented. Um, even the opponents of Jesus didn't dispute they did miracles. He did miracles. They just didn't like the fact he did them on the Sabbath. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, so, but then I began to think, well, what about today? Is God still in the miracle business today? And I really wanted to explore it. So I spent two years investigating the supernatural um, to try to get to that issue of whether or not God is still supernaturally intervening in people's lives. Uh -huh. how, do you, how would you define the supernatural or a, yeah. or a miracle? Yeah, you know, we throw around that term all the time. You know, hey, I'm downtown. I found a parking place. It's a miracle, you know. And, and uh, so what is a miracle? Richard Pertill, who is a philosopher, uh, I think he had the best definition. Uh, he said, a miracle is an event brought about by the power of God that is a temporary exception to the ordinary course of nature for the purpose of showing that God has acted in history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good way. It's a, a temporary exception to the, uh, the, the ordinary laws and operation of nature. That's really good. I think, I think somewhere in this book, you... And again, I listened to it last yeah. night, so it's all in here. Yeah. Somewhere in here, um, you, you guys talk about, you know, like if aliens were watching humans. Yeah. They would observe us. They'd figure it out that we stop at red lights. Yeah. We slow at yellow lights. We go at green lights. And that would be observed behavior. And yes. that's how they would. But then all of a sudden... When a police car comes by and runs a red light, yeah. that would be the anomaly, right? right. Exactly. And, and that's sort of kind of the, the, the premise. Yeah, it is. I mean, David Hume, the famous skeptic, Scottish skeptic, who wrote um, uh, Against Miracles, um, I think misunderstood the concept, really, of what miracles were. Because he said, basically, he said several things. But one of the things he said is that uh, miracles are impossible because they violate the laws of nature. We know that those are inviolable, and therefore... Uh, miracles are impossible. Uh, but that's not really what a miracle is. If, if I had an apple and I were to drop it, the law of gravity says it would hit the floor. 
Mm -hmm. But if I have that apple and I dropped it and you reach in and grab it before it hits the floor, you're not overturning the law of gravity. You're not um, destroying or, or yeah. uh, you know, you are just intervening. With a new energy. With a new energy. Yeah, you're yeah. intervening. And, and that's what God does. So if God created the universe, I think we have good evidence from cosmology, physics, biochemistry, and so forth, that God did create the universe. If that is true, then of course he can intervene. Yeah. It's like child's play. Walk on water? Come on. That's no problem. <laughs> Virgin birth? Yeah, it's child's play. So, um, of course he can intervene if he indeed is the creator. No, that, that is great. So, when you were writing this book, like, who were some of the, some of the, what was some of the research you were doing as, as you did it? Well, I, I tried to read all sides of it. Of course, I read David Hume, the skeptic. I read, um, um, articles in Skeptic Magazine and, and, and various other um, periodicals that uh, try to oppose um, Christian beliefs in miracles. Um, I read a lot of, you know, C.S. Lewis wrote on miracles. Um, Eric Metaxas wrote a New York Times bestseller a few years ago on miracles. Uh, so there's a lot of material out there. Um, you have to be a little bit discerning. Some of it can be a little whacked out. Yeah. But um, I, I tried to plow through that and determine who would be the best people to interview on both sides. Uh -huh. And so in my book, I give the first three chapters to a skeptic, Michael Shermer, the editor of Skeptic Magazine. Yeah. He said, give us your best shot against miracles. And uh, and he does. And then the rest of the book, I sort of respond to his um, uh, opposition to miracles and show there really is good evidence that God is supernaturally intervening uh, today. Yeah, so... so as you were interviewing him, yeah. that's a fascinating like intro to the book. Too. Yeah, it was um, fun. It was fun. He, I, I consider him a friend. Yeah, yeah. It, it what's great about your style of writing too is that like you in whoever you're interviewing, like as a reader, we, we get endeared to him. Like, <laughs> oh, he's a skeptic, but he's kind of cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's a nice guy. Yeah. And, and you 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 kind of like connect you connect yeah. us to him, but. Um, in in his skepticism, yeah, right, and he he's a deconversion story. Yes, when it when it comes down to it, yeah. In, what were some of his oppositions to the miraculous? Well, um, you know, I think what happens in a lot of cases with skeptics, and I see this a bit in Michael, is that when it comes to the topic of miracles, they tend to ratchet up their skepticism to unreasonable levels. So in other words, his magazine published an article by a woman physician who's an atheist. And she said, what would it take for me to consider the possibility that something miraculous is happening? She said, well, what if a chicken learned how to read and then beat a grandmaster at chess? Then maybe I'd start to think maybe something's going on. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? You know, to me, that's just ratcheting the level of skepticism to unreasonable levels. To me, I think we can be confident that a miracle has taken place if we have um, um, solid documentation, if we have multiple eyewitnesses who have no motive to deceive, if there are no alternative naturalistic explanations, uh -huh. and if it takes place in the context of prayer, um, I think we can be confident that uh, something miraculous has really occurred. Yeah. Now... In, in this book, he talks about a study done on prayer right. that has no, uh, and, and what that study came to the conclusion yeah. is that prayer had no effect right. whatsoever, right. not even a placebo. Right. Right. But then, um, and I, I remember reading that going, no, <laughs> no, not true. You yeah. know, yeah. because part of belief, right, is we choose what we're going to believe and then sure. we build a case for it. Yeah. That's the way all humans work. The, you know, it's the divine bet. Yeah. No, like, what are you betting on? Um. So, but then you later in the book quote um, a, a study, yeah, an impressive study yeah. actually done. Do you remember? Do you remember? Oh, sure. You know, I'm putting you on the spot with this one. No, he he quotes a study that showed that prayer had no effect. Well, I researched that study and went to a PhD from Harvard who was quite familiar with that study mm -hmm. and found out that the Christians who were praying in that study weren't really Christians. I mean, they were part of a sect. That, that's that, right, they're part of a cult, yeah, right? Yeah, a cult like, that denies the existence of a personal God, that denies that the, the miracles are possible. Yeah. And, and so those were the only Protestants who were allowed to pray in this entire prayer But study. they didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. Or yeah, any, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, they so they weren't praying to God. 
They were, who knows what they were doing? Yeah. So, but and, and the other thing though, I think is I think there's a flaw in these kind of studies. So the typical study, and this is one of those, uh, and they show different things. There have been other studies that show that prayer does have an effect. Uh -huh. But what what it often happens is you take um, uh, three groups of people who are say recovering from a heart attack in the hospital, and you divide them. You divide them in three groups. One group is prayed for. Uh, by evangelical Christians, another group, a group is not prayed for, and another group is prayed for, uh, and they don't tell them they're uh -huh. being prayed for, and they measure the results. Well, the problem with that is you can't rule out that some people are praying for the people who supposedly aren't being prayed for. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Uh -huh. If you've got relatives, even if you're an atheist and you're in the hospital, you probably have relatives who are praying for you. Yeah. So I don't. I just. And, and by the way, other studies have shown the opposite of the one that he cited. Sure. That prayer does have an effect, but I don't like those studies for that reason. I think they get quote unquote contaminated by other Christians who are praying who aren't part of the study. Yeah. What I look at, and this study will blow your mind. Um, miracles I discover tend to cluster. Yes, yes, and, you write all these clusters. Yes, they cluster in places where the gospel is breaking in for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mozambique, Brazil, China. Some estimates are 90% of the growth of the Church of China are the result of people themselves or someone they know have had a supernatural healing. So there, there's this fuels the beginning of the church in new areas. Well, there was an outbreak of miracles reported in Mozambique. So a professor at the University of Indiana... Secular University, who is a PhD from Harvard, said, I'm going to test it. Well, what did she do? She sent a team of researchers to Mozambique. They went into the remote areas of Mozambique and said, bring us your deaf and blind. So they did. And they immediately tested them scientifically right there. What's your vision level? How well can you see? Uh -huh. How well can you hear? They got that data. Yeah. Then they were immediately prayed for in the name of Jesus by people who have a track record of God using them in healings. Mm -hmm. Then, immediately after that, they're tested again. Is there any difference? And guess what they found? In virtually every case, there was some improvement of those people, uh, some extraordinary. In fact, the average increase in visual acuity was tenfold. Wow. And there was a woman named Martine who, when they first encountered her, was so deaf, she could literally not hear the equivalent of a jackhammer next to her. Sure. After 10 minutes of prayer in the name of Jesus, she could hear a normal conversation. Yeah. You know, a jackhammer is about 100 decibels. It's That's loud. right. Exactly. Right. Now she can hear normal. So what did they do? They said, they're blown away. So they said, we got to replicate this, see if we can replicate. So they went to Brazil another place where the gospel is breaking in. They got the same results. <laughs> now, here's the deal. This has been published in a secular, scientific, peer-reviewed medical journal. This is a valid scientific study. What I like about it is it, it factors out other people praying. It's sure. just test, pray, test. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, that's a really good um, uh, way of trying to get to the root of what what's going on. Well, and those are those are measurable things. That's like right. sometimes um, a lot of healing ministries yeah. heal back and shoulder pain. Yeah, right. Pain, right. And that's not a. And there can be a placebo effect. If people yeah. think they're going to feel better, often they do. Yeah, but these these are things that are tangible and measurable. Exactly. And that that is beautiful. Yeah. Um. So they they cluster yes. where the gospel's breaking forth. Right. 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 And, and that really mirrors the Book of Acts. That it does. That's right. Right. As the gospel breaks into new cultures, right. it's followed by signs of wonder. Right. And often these cultures in our day and age are um, in more primitive areas. They may not have high literacy rates and therefore giving them a copy of the gospel of John is not going to help them. Yeah. They can't read it. Um, and they, many people uh, may have a, a, a uh, some sort of uh, primitive supernatural beliefs. So for them, this demonstration of God's power uh, really speaks to them and points them toward the real God. Yeah, that, that is really cool. Now, not all miracle claims are legitimate, right. too. Right. right, and um, we you you see a lot of that in Western culture. Yeah. Um, so so tell tell me this. How do, how do we dis discern? Yeah. When something's a real miracle and something's a placebo. Yeah. And then so, you know sometimes there's charlatans out there too. That's right. So there could be fakery and fraud. There could be placebo effect. We talked about there could be uh, there could be cases where the original diagnosis was wrong. 
So you've been diagnosed with cancer. You're prayed for. The cancer's gone. But you didn't really have cancer in the first place. Maybe it was a mistake. Sure. Um, th those are all true, and, and those have happened. But I tried to filter those out and say, what about those cases where we have solid documentation, we have uh, credible eyewitnesses, we have no motive to deceive, where there's no naturalistic explanation, and where, um, where it takes place in the context of prayer. And so, um, you know, I have the case, for instance, of Barbara Snyder, which is, to me, the, the most remarkable one I encountered. Yeah. Barbara was uh, dying of multiple sclerosis. She was diagnosed at the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, she had multiple hospitalizations. She uh, literally, they said, she has no hope. Uh, in fact, her, her doctor said she is the most hopelessly ill patient I have ever seen. So they sent her home to die. Mm. She's in hospice at home. She, her lung, one lung is collapsed, one lung is at 50%. She's virtually blind. She can just see gray shapes. Her fingers are curled like this so that their fingers are touching her wrists. Mm -hmm. Her feet are permanently extended. Mm -hmm. um, she has a, feet, a, a, a tube in her throat so she can breathe, hooked up the oxygen canisters in the garage. Uh, she hadn't walked in seven years, so her, her legs had atrophied. And she's literally dying in bed. And they said, we're not going to revive her. Next time she gets a pneumonia, we're just going to let her die because it's, it's hopeless. Well, some of her friends called WMBI, which is a Christian radio station in Chicago, and said, could you just put out the word to pray for this woman, Barbara? She's dying. Mm -hmm. Well, we documented that 450 Christians began to pray for her because we have letters from them saying, I'm praying for you, Barbara. And those are the ones we know. The ones we know of yeah, a lot sure. more. So on Pentecost Sunday... She's in her room, and, and two of her friends are reading her some of these letters that they had received people praying for her. And Barbara hears the voice of God from the corner of the room saying, Get up, my child, and walk. And she, it's like, whoa, what the heck? So she ends up, long story short, pulling the tube out of her throat, jumping out of bed. And she said, Lee, you would think... You know, what's the first thing you notice? She said, you know, the, the first thing I noticed is my feet were flat on the floor. She said, I couldn't even wear slippers. My feet had been rigid and, and extended like mm -hmm. this. But my, and then I looked and my hands had unfolded and were, were back to normal. And then she said, the third thing I noticed, my vision was back. <laughs> I oh, my see. God. And she said, you think that'd be the first thing I'd notice. Yeah, but yeah. that was actually the third thing I noticed. Anyway, she was completely healed in that instant. Her father came in, began to waltz around the room with her. Her mother came in and dropped to her knees and grabbed her, her calves and said, your muscles are back. Her atrophied legs had actually regained their muscles. She was so, in her home. In she was in hospice, her home. Yeah, right. in hospice and home. So that God, night, Don't you want to be at the oh, first doctor visit? Well, <laughs> she told me about it. In fact, the doctor wrote a book about it because he was so blown away. Oh he said, gosh. when I saw her walking the next day down the corridor to his office... His first thought was, oh, she died, and that's a ghost. Oh, my God. He said, this is medically <laughs> impossible. Yeah. So, you know, now I interviewed Barbara. We have, you know, Barbara's uh, scientific and medical records are there. She's, um, she's been healthy now for several decades. Mm -hmm. um, she married a pastor. Oh, wow. And they had a little Wesleyan church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I love that. And sweetest woman. Sure. And just And she just, when she talks about this healing... Even though it was decades it's ago. It's so miraculous. It's got to be hard for people that weren't there to believe it. Exactly. But you know what? Even the Chicago Tribune, a secular newspaper, carried an article about it the next day. Saying, basically, we can't explain this. Yeah. Right? You know? You drop an apple. Yeah. Another energy exactly. comes in and, and yeah. does that. No, that is that is excellent. So, in, in recent years, yeah. scientists have been trying to test miracles. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And... Um, th th that, that's interesting. Like, what, is, what does the research show as they're yeah. testing it? Well, I, I think the Mozambique study is very illuminating. Uh -huh. Even the um, PhD from Harvard who, I, who did the study, I said, what's going on here? And she said, something is going on. She said, wow. she said this isn't, um, you know, we don't create some emotional atmosphere that's affecting people that way. This isn't, um, this isn't televangelists trying to get people to send in their money. It's not fakery. It's not fraud. Mm -hmm. Something is going on. Wow. And I think it's true. I think it's something miraculous. The other thing that we're seeing is that secular, peer-reviewed medical journals are now publishing case studies. In fact, since my book has come out, there have been some more recent ones 
Uh, my favorite one uh, that was published in a, a medical journal recently is a woman who had been blind for over a dozen years from juvenile macular degeneration, which is an incurable condition. She read Braille. She walked with a cane. Uh, she went to a school for the blind. Uh, and she married a, a Southern Baptist pastor. <laughs> and um, one night, they're getting ready for bed, and he just put his hand on her shoulder and said, Lord, and he prayed. He said, Lord, I know you could heal her right now if you want to. I know you can do it, and I pray that right now you would reach down and you would heal her. <laughs> and she opened her eyes to perfect vision. Wow. And that's been 47 years later. This is 47 years later. Wow. She's had perfect vision now for 47 years. And how do you explain that? Yeah. How do you explain an incurable condition like that, instantaneously healed at the moment of prayer? Um, other than something is going on. Yeah, yeah. Something is happening here. And, um, you know, there was another person, very, very similar case uh, of a person, another incurable condition uh, called gastroparnesis, I believe it's called. And uh, so my point is, researchers are not taking this seriously. Yeah. And, they're, and they're really studying the medical records and they're interviewing witnesses and they're really putting this to the test. And what they're finding is there are, inex there are things that are inexplicable apart from the hand of God. Yeah. And, you know, as the more we learn about the world yeah. and the universe we live right. in, um, we, we find there's lots of things that are inexplicable. Yeah. Right? So we, we have to... Um, Science has to, they come to grips with that. And yeah. they're coming to grips with, there are just right. things we don't know. That's exactly right. You know, like, you know, we see models of a molecule. We've never seen a molecule. Right, that's true. <laughs> they can't really, they can only with math prove there are molecules, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, I guess, like, one of the people you interview in here is, it's interesting because I've heard him speak before. Yeah. It's Dr. Strauss from, I believe, the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, he was a brother of my New Testament professor. And yeah. How, how in the world are you a New Testament scholar and your brother's a particle physicist? With PhD and published <laughs> all over the world, does work at the Super Collider in Switzerland. And, yeah. 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 So you you interview him. Yeah. Because you take it to like really to a particle level, to a molecular level, yeah. to, the, to this. and. What is his take on yeah. the supernatural? Well, his take is that um, if you look at cosmology, which is the origin of the universe, and you look at uh, physics and the fine-tuning of the universe, this tells us that there is a supernatural creator. Mm -hmm. So in other words, from cosmology, whatever begins to exist as a cause, we now know the universe began to exist at some point in the past. Therefore, there must be a cause behind the universe. What kind of a cause can bring a universe into existence? Mm -hmm. Must be powerful, given the immensity of the creation event. Must be smart, given the precision of it. Must be um, immaterial or spirit, because it existed before the uh, physical world. Must be eternal or timeless, because it existed before physical mm -hmm. time was created. Must be caring, because he created this habitat for it. Creative. I mean, you go down the list, it's a picture of God. Yeah. And then you go, the fine-tuning of the universe. Mm -hmm. Our universe, you look at the numbers that govern the operation of the universe, yeah. the constants of physics and the, the laws of physics, they conspire in an inexplicable way for life to be able to exist. And it is just a couple examples. Uh, the law of gravity. We know what the law of gravity is, but the law of gravity is set at a, at, a, at a value that is so specific that if you were to change it in just a minute way, life would be impossible. So for example, uh, imagine a ruler across the entire known universe, 15 billion light years, yeah, and it's broken down into one inch increments. That represents the, the range plausibly along which the law of gravity could have been set. Could have been set anywhere along that ruler, but it's set at a specific place so life can exist. If you were to move it one inch compared to the 15 billion light year width of the universe, intelligent life is impossible anywhere. Yeah. That's just one of more than 50 of these parameters. Even the concept of a ruler that's 15 billion light yeah. years, like a light year to us yes. is such an abstract concept. Exactly. I mean, I'll you, give you another one. The, um, uh, the ratio between the electromagnetic force and the, force, uh, the gravitational force is set so precisely. It's set to 
um, a precision of one part in a thousand or ten thousand trillion trillion trillion. Now that's a big number. How do you explain it? That would be like taking a continent the size of North America and piling dimes on it <laughs> all the way to the moon, two hundred eighty thousand, uh, uh, two hundred thirty thousand miles to the moon. Uh, so you, you picture a continent with dimes to the moon. Now multiply that times a billion. So you got a billion continents the size of North America with dimes piled to the Stack moon. to the moon. Now take one dime at random, spray paint it red, and mix it into that pile somewhere. And then I blindfold you and say, you can go among this billion continents and you can go among these dimes going all the way up to the moon. You can only pick out one dime. What are the odds it would be the red one? The same odds of, of the electromagnetic force and, and the uh, gravitational force having the precise ratio that they do. <laughs> I'm not taking that bet. No, no. <laughs> Those are not good odds. Exactly. In fact, when the, the physicist I interviewed, Dr. Strauss, said to me, when you get to numbers that big, there's a term that physicists use to describe that. I said, really, what is it? He said, impossible. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It ain't going to happen. And, and yet, we have all these examples. Now, how do you explain that away? As an atheist... You, the only way you can explain it away is to say, what if there were an infinite number of invisible universes that we can't see, touch, or know about, uh, and you spun these dials of all these numbers in all these universes, well, if there's an infinite number... Eventually, it, one's going to get it. And that would be us. Yeah. The problem with that is there is no evidence that there is an infinite number of other universes. Well, and besides which, if it took a... A, a more a, logical belief is God. That you're That's literally right. just making stuff up exactly. to get around God at exactly. that point. That's exactly. the crazy part. If it takes a finely tuned system to create a universe like this, it would create an even greater finely tuned system to create an infinite number of universes. Yeah. So. And, and that, that's where, when it, when it comes to skeptics, I have friends that are skeptics yeah. and people I love. And, um, and I, res I, res I respect it. But yeah. sometimes I try and remind them, like, you know, you're just building an argument that to support yeah. your belief. Like you're no different the than me. The odds are against you. And, yeah. and when you get to that level of an argument, yeah. you've literally tiptoed around the obvious. Yes, that's right. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Tiptoe around the obvious. That'd be a good book title. <laughs> there you go. Tiptoeing <laughs> around the there obvious. There you go. You, you or Mark can take that. So, <laughs> no, it, it's, it's great. So, there, you know, you write about the phenomenon of supernatural dreams yeah. in your book. Yeah. And that is a fascinating subject because there's a lot of that going on right now. There is. This is a, a phenomenon. We often see it, not exclusively, but we often see it in countries that are close to the gospel. Yeah. Generally, Muslim countries that are close to the gospel. And what's interesting about this is there is external corroboration to these. So, in other words, here's what happens. Uh, um, uh, a person in one of these close countries... Uh, I'll give you a, a real story about a woman by the name of Noor, who was a Muslim mother of, of eight children. She goes to sleep one night. She has a Jesus dream. It is the most vivid dream she's ever had in her life. And Jesus is there with her dream. She says, I've never felt free of shame, and, and, and I never felt such love in my life. And Jesus is walking with her along a lake, and it, she, he said, she is so pulled toward him. And she says, tell me more about you. And Jesus says, my friend will tell you more. And she said, who's your friend? And she realized then there was a man with them. And, and, and she sees this man, and then she wakes up. The next day, she goes to the crowded marketplace in Cairo. And she's walking, and she sees the man from her dreams. Mm. And she walks up and says, you're the man. And you go, whoa, whoa. You're the man of my dreams. Yeah, you're the man of my dreams. <laughs> and she, he's freaking out. She said, no, I saw you. You had the same glasses, the same clothes, the same. It's you. It's you. And he said to her, did you have a Jesus dream? And she said, yes. And he said, let me tell you about Jesus. He was a missionary. Oh, my gosh. And he sat down with the Bible and taught her about Jesus. And this is the pattern. It's not that people go to sleep, have a Jesus dream, and wake up a Christian. They go to sleep, they have this encounter with Jesus in their dreams, and Jesus points them towards someone else who is going to explain the gospel to them. They wake up, and then they encounter that person. That's the pattern that you generally see. Yeah. This is so pervasive in the Middle East that one Christian group put an ad in a Cairo newspaper, and the ad said, 
Did you meet a man in white in your dream? Call us and we'll tell you about him. And, and people call and say, yeah, 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 who is this man in my dream? I met this man. I had this sense of love and grace. And, 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 you know, and that's how pervasive it is. Now, I uh, was a teaching pastor at a church in Houston, Texas. We have a lot of connections with the Middle East and the oil industry mm -hmm. in Houston. And we had a woman in our community who had had a Jesus dream when she was younger. She married a man, a Muslim. They came to Houston for the oil industry. Um, she meets a neighbor who is a Christian. And um, um, she has another dream. And in this dream, she's in a body of water up to her waist. And there's a man with her with a book. And he's reading from the book, and he, he's got tears in his eyes. She knew nothing about baptism. I mean, mm -hmm. she's a Muslim background. And she wakes up. She meets a neighbor. Her neighbor invites her to our church for Easter services. She comes to our church. She sits there, and she sees the man who was with her in the water. His name is Alan. Wow. Alan comes up to her. You're the man. You were, you were the man. I saw you. You were reading from a book. Alan is our pastor of baptism. Oh, my gosh. She ends up coming to faith in Christ, and just like her dream, she's baptized in our outside baptismal uh, pond just as the dream foretold. Wow. And um, she's a, growing in her faith. Her husband doesn't know that she's a believer because it would cause all mm -hmm. kinds of problems. But um, there's an example right from my church yeah. in America yeah. of this kind of thing taking place. Now, you you write about the why behind this. Because some, of, some yeah. people watching right now will be like, well, why yeah. do they need to have a dream? Why right. can't they just get on the internet and figure this out? Right. Or, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Why is it happening? And it is prevalent yes. in, in Islamic countries. Right. Um, I talk to missionaries. Yeah. Uh, you hear um, that there's a story going around on the internet right now that the fastest growing church in the world might be in Iran. It's That's an right. underground church, right? right? So why is this happening? Yeah, and Tom Doyle, who's the expert who wrote a book about this on dreams and visions and what's happening. I, I, he, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, Lee, I could pick up the phone right now call one of my friends in Lebanon and they'll have a story from today about a dream that's just yeah. taking place. So you're right, it's very prevalent. I think it's because um, there, are so, there are millions of people who are living in places where it is illegal to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. And God's love is so great, his desire to see his children come to him in, in repentance and faith and become his followers and spend eternity with him is so strong that he will do what it takes to reach them. And he's using these dreams, these supernatural interventions, in order to point people toward the truth of who he is. To see the sons of Ishmael. Yeah. No, exactly. that is beautiful. Um, you know, you are uh, working on a new book right now. Yeah. And uh, what's it about? Yeah, it's called The Case for Heaven. And the subtitle is A Journalist Investigates the Evidence for an Afterlife. And um, it started, uh, my interest in this particularly, um, 10 years ago when I almost died. Um, my wife found me unconscious. Um, I opened my eyes in the emergency room. The doctor said, you're one step away from a coma, two steps away from dying. And I was on the edge of death for a while with kind of a rare condition called hyponatremia. And um, um, so that experience, you know, as a Christian, do I believe in heaven? Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. How, where, where's my confidence level? Yeah. I mean, you know, do, are, are there good reasons beyond just reading in the Bible, which, mm -hmm. which I believe is authoritative, but it, it made me wonder about what is the evidence that there yeah. is an afterlife? And so I spent two years investigating uh, the afterlife, the, the, the question of how do we know that there is an existence beyond this one? And um, um, so, uh, it, you know, it was a fascinating experience. And I think in light of covid you know, my wife and I were at a restaurant a couple of weeks ago in Texas, and we got a conversation with the waitress, who's about 18 years old, and she started to cry. She had tears in her eyes. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, I almost didn't come to work today. We lost a family member to COVID. Mm -hmm. And I thought, here's a young woman, 18 years old, probably never thought about death before, and now she's pondering the fragility of life. Mm -hmm. And so I lost my brother to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so many people know someone who has died yeah. in this pandemic. And I think it's kind of raised our level of curiosity. 
How can I be confident? How can I know? Wow. You know, the Bible says these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, God doesn't want you in a sense of state of anxiety or wondering about it. We can know. So I went out to establish what is the evidence for an afterlife? What is the evidence for heaven? Mm -hmm. What is the supporting evidence for the biblical beliefs in hell? What about reincarnation? And I had an opportunity, Sean. This was a rare treat. Um, right before he died, shortly before he died, to spend the day in his home with Luis Palau, who wow. was the great evangelist yeah. who shared yeah. his faith with a billion people around the world. Yeah, yeah. He knew he was dying. And I interviewed him. I'm, I'm friends with Andrew, his son. I, yeah, yeah, Andrew's a great guy. Oh, Kevin, his other what son. An incredible great family. Guy. Incredible great, family. Great people. And so he, uh, Luis knew he was dying. And um, I interviewed him about what's that like? as a follower of Christ, knowing that you're going to die? How does that change your perception of heaven? How does that change your... And it was a moving, profound experience. And he said one thing I'll never forget. He said, Lee, at the end of the day, when you get to the end of your life, you will never regret being courageous with your faith. Say that again. Say, let's look at the camera yeah, and say that. Yeah, that yeah, that's said, at the end of your life, at the end of your life, when when uh, all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. I thought, you know, coming from him, that was a powerful, powerful statement. And, um, you know, he then went to be with the Lord, uh, you know, not long ago. And, um, you know, but he lived a life uh, committed to sharing this life-changing, yeah. eternity-altering gospel of Jesus. Yeah. Um, to an entire world. Yeah, just you talking about it, it has me excited, and um, I'm hoping I can get you to come out and talk to the people yeah. in, in Clovis, at Clovis Hills about it. Oh, that'd be great. So good. So, I'd love to do that. You know, I want to thank you so much for this interview and just uh, giving us your time. Sure. And just, you know, what you've contributed to the faith lives of millions of people, uh -huh. self-included. Uh -huh. So thank you so much. It's been a great adventure. I never could have anticipated if it, oh, my life as an atheist. Uh, you know, one of my colleagues from the Chicago Tribune from those days and I were talking recently and uh, he said, you know, we all expected you were going to become the publisher, the editor of the Tribune, our boss. And he said, nobody thought you were going to be a Jesus freak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. I was one of those least likely conversions. But, uh, you know, the greatest joy in my life is to be an ambassador for Christ, to, to tell yeah. people the good news. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Lee. God thanks, bless. Sean.